All right, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining this session. My name is Miao Jiang. I'm a program manager on the Azure API management team. This is my fifth build, but this is the very first time that I'm doing a co-presentation with one of our amazing customers, Vips. So in this session today, joining me on the stage is Sven Melvik, who is a senior cloud engineer from Vips, and Helg Testo, who leads the platform team at Vips. So in this session today, you will learn how Microsoft Azure powered Vips to become the number one payment service in Norway. We will be talking about the past, present, and the future of Vips, including the evolution of the product, the organization, and the solution architecture. You will also learn the journey about how Vips figured out an effective deployment model that works for them. Also, we will be talking a little bit about API management and how it fits into your microservice architectures. And finally, if we have time, we will take a few questions. All right, without further ado, let me hand it over to Helg. Take it away, Helg. Thank you. I'm going to tell you about uh, past, present, and future of Vips and provide you with some uh, context for the, the choices we've made. Nice. Cool. So what is uh, Vips? Vips is uh, mobile payments, uh, primarily person-to-person uh, -person payments and also merchant payments Ethics like um, um, pop-up stores and uh, invoice payments and online payments. In 2015, Vips uh, was launched by DNB Bank, the biggest bank the in Norway. Was quite it was launched with a massive ad campaign, uh, the biggest until then in uh, Norway, including uh, TV ads uh, online, um, and also reaching out directly to their uh, 2.2 million uh, customers. Uh, in slightly less than a year, uh, Vips had achieved uh, more than 90% brand recognition in Norway, which was unprecedented at the time for any brand and highly unusual for a payment service. 40% of the Norwegian population has signed up as uh, users. Uh, and we gained a critical mass where we had kind of the network effect where people would prefer to be paid by VIPs instead of receiving cash uh, or uh, bank transfers. In 2017, uh, VIPs came out on top of the YouGov uh, word of mouth ranking among millennials in Norway. Uh, above well-known brands such as Netflix and uh, Spotify. In 2017, uh, Vips went from being a product inside of DNB Bank to becoming a standalone company uh, and uh, was then owned by 107 banks in Norway, pretty much all the banks. And in 2018, uh, we uh, merged with uh, two other bank-owned uh, companies. Uh, Bank Accept, which is a, a national card scheme, uh, and Bank ID, which is electronic ID in, uh, in Norway. Uh, and those are still, uh, still products and brands within the VIPS company. And, and when I refer to VIPS, it's usually the VIPS product, uh, the mobile payments. So uh, VIPS has uh, expanded gradually from person-to-person uh, -person payments. Uh, and then using that user base uh, and, and moving towards merchant payments, um, like invoices, online payments, and experimenting with in-store payments. We have uh, expanded the reach, um, uses of all ages, and including temporary residents, for example. Uh, and we made a version of VIPs uh, that's available for kids, managed by parents, so it's a safe experience for them. Vips also has uh, international ambitions, uh, hoping to replicate the success in Norway into other markets. Today, Vips has 3.3 uh, million users, and that's 60% uh, of the Norwegian population. On a typical day, we have uh, half a million person-to-person -person payments, which is uh, you know, one out of 10 people in Norway paying with Vips every day. And uh, during events like the, um, the national fundraisers and National Independence Day, those numbers more than double as people queue up for buying, buying hot dogs and, and ice cream or they're encouraged to donate on uh, national TV. I'm going to tell you a bit about the organizational journey. Um, there were some pivotal moments, especially when becoming a standalone uh, company and also when, uh, when merging. So um, originally, um, DNB outsourced the development 
uh, that was a very useful model for um, getting to market quickly. But as we ha uh, have great ambitions and uh, wanting to do more, we switched to, uh, to an insourcing model where we have uh, autonomous teams owning the different uh, products. Um, different products like, like the merchant services, the core payments, and so on. Um, we're currently approximately 300 people uh, in WIPs in total, a half uh, working in technology, and we're growing uh, steadily. So it's, a, it's a flat hierarchy, uh, classic Norwegian model, where you have uh, empowered employees taking a lot of responsibility for both the product and their da daily tasks. Um, and this size allows us to do uh, communication and changes quite quickly internally, and that, that gives us some, some more opportunity to, to uh, do technical changes as well. The architecture is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. We have clients connecting through API management to uh, application servers. They mainly run in managed Kubernetes. They communicate with, um, with storage and external services like hard networks and banking infrastructure, and also communicate with each other to some extent through either events or di uh, direct calls. So we've, we've been on a on journey from on-prem to a cloud. Uh, it's been a, a multi-step uh, process for us. The first one was basically a lift and shift, where we moved the data center into the cloud, running on uh, VMs and, and a SQL Server. Uh, the next step was to, um, to split into multiple services uh, and running on containers. Uh, and uh, the last step is to embrace the cloud fully, using all the services that we've seen uh, on this conference and everything that's available to us in the cloud. So we have seen several benefits of uh, moving to Azure. Um, one of the most important ones has been the elastic capacity. Uh, being able to handle spikes and, uh, and different usage patterns. And we also see uh, faster development and, and freedom to experiment as we can easily set up uh, environments and test services. And the, the security model and the access control in, in Azure allows us to, to delegate the responsibility to the different teams, enabling them to take full responsibility of the services. Uh, and it, it's a great benefit when moving towards more uh, of a DevOps uh, setup. So as we've um, evolved our architecture from a monolith to services, we see that API management has enabled us to, to um, tie this all together, uh, enabled us to, um, to make a single consistent uh, VIP service for our customers. Um, so API management, it's, it's a very, um, very powerful and flexible tool. Um, and the, the most important job it does for us currently is to um, compose APIs. Um, we also use it for coarse-grained uh, access control, although the, the services are ultimately responsible for their own access control and, and authentication, but we, we can stop uh, requests uh, in API management um, if they're not supposed to go through. And the same with rate limiting. It uh, allows us to, to uh, protect the rest of our infrastructure and, and um, increasing overall reliability. So next, uh, my colleague Sven is going to uh, tell you about how we iterated on our uh, technical setup. Thank you, Helge, for your introduction. Um, I'm going to tell you about our journey from where we started um, with APM and AQS and how we helped our product teams to deploy the services and their APIs to you know, APIM and, and AQS to where we are today, where those product teams basically do everything by themselves. So we had our product teams. Um, we had the merchants. We had the invoice team, um, the payments. They were building their payment engine, the core engine. And we have the, the Wipsers. Um, those were building the Wips app um, that everybody has. And those teams were always um, building um, or, or working with very high-level languages like, um, like Java and, and Kotlin and, and Golang. But when it comes to CI CD pipelines, for example, and, and monitoring, logging, um, deploying to APIM, AKS, um, they, they kind of had a problem all the time. And they were very much dependent on um, specialized teams that did the work for them, basically. 
So everything had always to go through them. And of course, that took a lot of time and it was frustrating for them. And, and things were very slow. So in order to really grow very fast, we had to have uh, another approach. Um, so we had our teams basically, um, and we needed our teams to do everything by themselves. So deploying, um, setting up all they need to, to actually do uh, APIM related task and, and AQS. So I wanna start with AKS, um, how we started and, and how we deploy today. So in the middle we have our specialized team. This specialized team is working with APIM and, and um, had all those APIs. On the other side, we had our product teams. Our product teams did basically everything with AKS. So they could do whatever they wanted. They could execute them in into pods. They could deploy how they wanted. So they probably had a lot of fun. And if you see in this graphic here, um, they were owners of their application and they did deployment to AQS in basically totally different ways. And we had teams that didn't know how to deploy to AQS, and what they did, they approached also the, um, the specialized teams that did all the work for them. What they did basically was um, copy pasting from another team um, the way how they deployed and, and pushed it um, to the other um, repositories. Um, so they made it work. But this is of course a problem because you have a lot of different ways of, of deploying. And when it comes to logging and monitoring, so nobody really um, understood how it worked and everybody did it in a totally different way. Um, and there was a lot of support required from the, um, from the specialized team um, this way we worked. So what we really wanted was kind of an um, approach like we do, do with APIs. Um, APIs are very often defined in a Swagger file. Um, a Swagger file um, basically is, uh, describes what you want, but not how you do anything. So we wanted the same for our application. We want to just describe what we want, but not telling um, or, or giving the responsible to our product seems um, to say how they have to do it. So here's our service configuration file that we introduced. Um, it's basically um, a file where you define um, everything you need about your application um, and, and, how, and what you want uh, in the AKS clusters. You define the port, um, you define a, a name, um, environment variables, some resource limits, um, everything you need to know um, in order to deploy that application. But what you don't need to specify is how you will do it. So what we do, or what we did, we put those service configuration files uh, into the um, projects of the application and deployed um, those applications in a very unified way. So that those product teams didn't do that anymore. So they also, they, they only need the file and, and they are done basically. So the good thing here is that security and logging is all taken care of this way. So they don't need to understand this way. So this is very fast because they just define a, a simple security a, 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 a configuration file. But on the flip side, um, you have really no relationship anymore to Kubernetes. Um, you, you can't probably execute yourself into pods anymore. Uh, it might be harder to debug. And for some developers, it feels more like magic because they don't know anything about Kubernetes anymore. So everything, uh, all tooling, um, logging, monitoring has to be in place um, before uh, being able to do that. So our situation had changed a bit. Um, we had still this, uh, this specialized team um, that worked towards APIM and were um, responsible for all APIs. But when it comes to the product teams uh, doing deployments to AQS, 
it was a very consistent way now to deploy and uh, it made it a lot easier and it was very fast and very nice for, for, our, um, for our development teams. So now I want to talk a bit about APIs, um, how we started there and where we are today. So we, have, we had in the beginning one repository with all of our APIs. And this API M repository was maintained by a specialized team. So whenever an API had changed, basically a Swagger file, um, the team that did the change in the Swagger file need to sync with the specialized team, get it into the repository. And what they did then, they deployed everything at once to API management. And this might be great because um, what's, what's an API uh, management? It what reflects the code base. Um, you also only need one CI CD pipeline. So for the specialized team, it was very easy and un understandable everything. Um, they pretty much did know what, what happened. But this process is very time consuming, of course, because you only want to um, change one tiny little bit. And for suddenly, you have to deploy everything to APIM, so. Um, and here's also a very, very high risk involved. Um, imagine that you have an incident in production and you know exactly what you wanna change and how to fix it, and you basically do it in portal first. And when you're done, you uh, merge the changes that affect or that fixed uh, the problem, um, you do it in the code base and you're basically done. But there are scenarios where it's more complicated and you have to do more changes. So you probably do it in a test environment first and you change here a bit and then you change there a bit and finally you come up with a solution and you uh, deploy it into production. Um, also in the portal first because it's very fast and you know what to do and you don't need to go to the pipeline and so on. Um, but what well, the problem here is that you basically have three different states now. You have your portal um, and uh, you have APM in production, you have the test environment, and you have your code base, and you can end up in three totally different states um, if you're unlucky. Um, and we had that situation. Um, we had um, some, one day a product manager approached me and asked me to deploy an API um, because they had a really nice feature showing the account balance in the VIPs up. Um, the service was already running, and they really wanted to get it out um, today. And we analyzed um, the APM instance and production, and we looked at the code base. It was a bit different, and the test environment was different as well. So we really didn't know if we could deploy that, because then we might have destroyed other APIs. So this was not an option. Um, so what we needed was more like a team that can do everything on their own. Um, it, it's not a good situation where you have a, a, a product team that needs specialized teams to do something that they don't know anything about. So we need a team that is responsible for everything, for application, API, DevOps, monitoring, um, and for the APIs deploying to APM, of course. So, but first, we had to restructure our APIs a bit. So, we had some APIs that were in front of, of multiple applications, and in order to make a, a product team really responsible for its own API, um, we had to split them in the way that they really can take ownership and not are depending on other teams and, and that they need to speak to them. So, we had to restructure a bit. Um, what we did, did then um, later was we made, it, made a change in the way we deploy so that we just deploy one API at a time. So this was suddenly um, a lot faster and the risk was uh, tremendously lower because we suddenly could deploy um, the account balance API. So this was great. But on the flip side, still we needed two Swagger files. Um, so why did we need two Swagger files? We have the project um, with the application, 
and the code basically was generated with a Swagger file. But at the same time, we have AP, the APM repository with all APIs. And those APIs are expressed through Swagger files. So the specialized teams still had to sync with the project teams to, to get those um, APIs, those, those Swagger files. So this was uh, still a problem. Um, what we really needed was um, then to move those APIs into the projects of, uh, of the um, product teams so that they were responsible and could take ownership over their, their APIs. So we wanted to get rid of the APM repository, and we did that. So on the left side, we have the APM repository, and in this example, we have two, um, two APIs. We have the payments and we have invoice. And we basically just split it up into two and move them in the um, in the repositories for the projects. Um, down there, on the right side, we see the invoice swagger file. Um, this file specifies the API. Um, and then we have a policy file. Um, a policy file lets you change uh, the behavior of an API. Um, I will go into that a bit later. Um, you have the same for operation policies. Um, basically, you can change the behavior of endpoints as well. And you have an ARM template. And ARM templates were really a problem to us, or more a problem to, to the product teams, not so much to the, um, to the specialized teams um, who wrote those files uh, in the beginning. And if we look at one example here, there are really three important informations. Um, we, have, uh, we have the name, and we have the path to where to, uh, to, to access the API, and we have also the Swagger file, or the path to the Swagger file, and we have the policy file, um, the path to the policy file. So that's all we need, actually, to deploy an API. Everything else um, is quite a complicated for a development team to understand and to maintain. Um, so basically, whenever they needed a change in an API or set up a totally new API, they, in theory, could, to, could do this uh, on their own. But what they did, they approached the specialized team that did the job for them. So, but basically, we, we had some, some good things here. Um, teams really took ownership uh, suddenly, and they were faster because um, um, they, they were on, on top of everything suddenly, and we also had only one Swagger file. So the communication between specialized teams and, and the um, product teams um, was a lot better, or we didn't have that much, that much uh, com communication uh, anymore. Uh, but on the flip side still, we have those ARM templates, and they were really a problem because suddenly they had to do that, and they didn't know what to do and so on. And um, there are also some weird things with ARM templates. Um, they, they're not described this um, state um, for all scenarios. Um, for example, when you remove th something from an ARM template, it won't be removed um, from APM. You have to do it manually. Um, and for that, um, APM or, or ARM has a flag you can set. You can set the deployment option to complete. And this will definitely delete uh, what you what you have not have specified, but it will also delete everything that's defined in the same resource group. And since we have deployed or defined everything that is uh, in APM defined in the same resource group, everything would basically be uh, deleted. So this was not an option to us. Um, so we needed to get rid of that as well. Um, so the situation has changed a bit. Um, we have the product teams. Um, they are really f uh, comfortable with AQS now, and they can do everything there. But on the right side, the APIM, um, they basically can do, they can deploy to APM, but they are still not comfortable, and they are quite dependent on, on um, the specialized team still. So we, we still had a, quite a problem here that we had to solve. So. We looked at some other options to deploy, and we came over the PowerShell module. 
um, it's called Azure RM uh, for resource management. Um, I guess there's another one, the, the AZ. Um, but this one is documented, and it's well documented. Um, it's very easy to understand, um, add API, delete API, um, and so on. And I, we wanted to, um, to give it a try. So I want to just show you how really how easy it is to, to use. So first of all, you define a context, um, telling basically where the API M is, which resource group, and what the name of the API M um, instance is. When you've done that, um, you want to add an API. Um, you do this with the import, give it the context, um, then you specify the format. Uh, in this case, it is uh, the Swagger format, and there are some other um, formats you can use. And then basically you specify the path, so where the Swagger file is, and the path from where you want to access um, your API, um, uh, API from, and an ID. So that's all those information that you also have specified in the ARM template, uh, but in a more convenient and, and more easy and understandable way. Um, when you execute that, um, you get a couple of information, a bunch of information back, the ID, uh, description, um, everything basically what you described in the Swagger file and some additional information. Um, there's another um, um, command, it's a get API, um, define the context again, and then the ID, and then you get the same result back. So the next what we want to do is we want to add a policy. Um, as I said, a policy file lets you change the behavior of an IPIM. Um, we'll go more into details very soon. Um, but in this case, you want to set the the um, URL to the service. Um, so we need this policy file. We need to change a bit there. So you define as well the, the context, give it an ID, and the path to the policy file, and then you basically are, are finished and, and good to go. So our situation has totally changed. Um, now we have our, um, our, special, our, our uh, product teams uh, that also can deploy to APM totally on their own, because what, what they need is only, um, is only a, a, a file, a, a Swagger file, and a, a tiny little uh, policy file that's really easy to describe. That's everything. So now they have um, the, the configuration file for the service, they have a specification file for the APIs, and that's everything they really need um, to do in order to, to deploy anything. So that's total ownership now, and we have no specialized teams uh, anymore. They're, they're basically gone. So I, we like really much the, the PowerShell commando, um, Azure RM. It's really easy to understand. Um, but we had some, some um, arguments or some discussions about PowerShell. Uh, we have not used PowerShell so much before, um, but we wanted to get a, a, a try, and we liked it very much because it's very easy to understand and uh, we have some, some scripts that um, lets you add uh, an API and product and other things, and, but they are very small and maybe one, one, um, one page of a, of a monitor, so it's really nice. Um, but of course, for, for some people, it might be some magic, again, because they were more into ARM templates and knew what they did and so on, and suddenly they do nothing and um, they have to depend on, and rely on, on other people. So that might be a problem for, for some people. So now I want to talk a bit about um, API um, policies um, that lets you change the behavior of an API. Um. So you can also do some other stuff with uh, policies. You can do um, you can do header validation and you can do mocking um, and and rate limit limiting are we using a lot. Um, for example, you want to um, make sure that your payment engine or your payment API um, isn't called more than maybe 10 times uh, per minute from the same user. Um, all that stuff uh, you can do um, in APM with a policy. And that way you can also make sure you get your money um, when you want to monetize your website. You can say that this person um, um, has just uh, has only um, one month uh, to, to go for, for this using this API, and you can do this in, in policies. And in policies, 
um, when the request comes in, it goes into an inbound section where I can do stuff, um, so right after it comes in. Um, you can do the same stuff in the back end where before it gets out to the service. And you can uh, apply some additional information to the response um, in the outbound section um, of a policy. And then it might happen that you have a timeout from a service. Um, it's, you never will get back any, any information from a service. Um, then you have the on error section where you also can do some, some nice stuff. So we were into, wanted to, uh, we have very much many policies uh, at VIPS. And some of those policies are expressing more or less the same things that uh, like in, in other policies. And we needed a way to, um, basically we wanted to template policies. But here's a basic uh, policy that we have. So we have the inbound section, we have the backend and the outbound section. Um, I have not uh, put into the N on error here. But here's how you set the backend uh, URL. Um, you set the placeholder here, AKS uh, backend URL. There's uh, uh, um, information that's also stored in APM in named values. Um, and that way, APM knows where to route the, the request to. But let's say that we want to, um, to mock this service. So we want to say that uh, or our service is not up and running right now. So we need a way um, to say to APM whenever a request comes in, please um, respond with some kind of static, uh, static response. So we have this mock template here. It's also um, um, in, in a template uh, engine um, where we say whenever a service is down, uh, then respond with a static request, 400, saying bad request, and some additional information. And what, how we integrate it then is basically um, putting just um, some line of code um, before the set backend service. So this information here um, is, um, is from a template engine. It's not Jinder 2, it's uh, Chameleon in this case, um, where you basically um, can define also variables like uh, is service down, uh, is payments down, which, where what you set to true or false in named values then. And that way you can nicely uh, mock um, your service then. And I'm now heading over to, to Miao, who will say more about APM and that what they have done. And yeah. Thank you, Sven, and Hauk. Uh, I love the story of Vips. Essentially, they have created a state-of-art application and grew it to become the most popular and the best a payment service application in Norway. And we all know that a product or a service is popular when it creates a verb in our dictionary, right? So as you have seen, VIPs, they use AKS to deploy their microservices and then deploy API management in front of their AKS clusters. So I'd like to talk a little bit about API management and how it fits into your microservice architectures. Just like VIPs, in the last few years, organizations are increasingly adopting the microservices architecture for its obvious benefits like independent development and uh, freedom to ch choose technology, independent uh, deployment and uh, release uh, cycle, granular scaling and fault isolation and so forth. However, everything comes with a price, right? When we adopt microservices, there are also challenges associated with this architectural style. To me, there are two main challenges. The first challenge is how do you manage the communication between your microservices? Because we know that for our application to work, those microservices need to talk to each other, right? However, with a growing network of microservices, how do you manage the communication between them, right? This can become pretty complicated pretty quickly. The industry has solved this challenge with service mesh, such as Istio, so I'm not going to focus on this challenge today. But I want to focus on the second challenge, which is how do you manage the communication between your application and the consumers of your application? This includes concerns like how do you decouple your front-end applications from your microservices? How do you handle all the cross-cutting concerns for your microservices, right? And this is where API management comes into play. Essentially, 
the answer to this challenge is your microservices need to be published and consumed as API, APIs through an API gateway. And in the last couple of years, we see more and more customers following the API gateway pa pattern by deploying API management in front of their microservice clusters. And this has certainly become one of our top use cases. So what are the benefits of deploying API management in front of your microservices? This comes down to the essence of API management. First of all, API management creates a facade in front of your backend services, which essentially hides your backend services from your front-end applications. This allows you to move your backend without impact on your front-end applications. It also makes it easy for you to re-architect or refactor your backends without impact on front ends. You can also choose to expose a subset of your backend capabilities to your front end applications, aggregate or slice your backend services into APIs. This facade can also help you to modernize your legacy uh, backends. Second, API management serves as a front door and a single point of ingress to all your backend microservices. It is a reverse proxy that routes all incoming requests to your backend. Because all the traffic goes through our API management gateway, this is where you can handle all your cross-cutting concerns for all your backend service. This includes authentication, authorization, throttling, transformation, and caching, and so forth. With the gateway taking care of all these cross-cutting concerns, it can help you to keep your microservices simple. And also, because all the traffic goes through the gateway, we also collect telemetry and the logs to help you to monitor and analyze your APIs. And last but not the least, we all know that the value of our backend services are realized when they are being used, right? With API management, it comes with a self-service developer portal, which allows you to provide a frictionless consumption experience to developers who need to use your APIs, no matter if they are external or internal developers. With this self-service portal, developers can easily discover your APIs, learn how to use your APIs by reading documentations that are automatically generated based on your API definition. They can also try your APIs without writing, any, uh, without writing a single line of code, request and receive access to your APIs. They can also download artifacts for your APIs, such as API specifications, code samples, and SDKs. They can also interact with the API provider through the portal. So these are all the features that come out of the box with API management, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So a lot of the things that we do in API management uh, result in the application of what we call policies. Essentially, API management policies encapsulate common uh, API and function, uh, functions such as access control, throttling, protection, and caching. Policies can be chained together into a pipeline to mutate request context or change your API behavior. They can also be set in the both inbound and outbound directions, as Sven has mentioned, to uh, apply to incoming requests and outgoing responses. You can also use policies to handle erroneous conditions. For example, if a request to your backend times out, you can use policies to route the request to an alternative backend. Also, uh, policies uh, can be applied at a variety of scopes. For example, you can have a group of policies for all your APIs, for things like logging, right? And then you can have another group of policies that only apply to a single API. So on the right-hand side here, you can see all of our out of, uh, 43 out-of-the-box policies. You can see policies for caching, for authentication, transformation, throttling, and so forth. So you don't have to use all of them, but it's good to know that when you need them, they will be there. So policies, they are great, right? But policies become more powerful and flexible when used together with what we call policy expressions and named values. Essentially, policy expressions, they are C-sharp snippets that you can embed in your policies to dynamically configure and conditionally execute your policies. And named values, they are key value pairs or properties that are shared across an API management instance to keep your secrets and the magic strings out of your policies. And if you name them well, they can also add semantics to your policies. And if you use a named value in multiple places in your policies, they also enable a single point of change. And you can also use them to provide environment-specific values. 
So in the bottom here, I have a quick example of uh, showing how you can use policies with C sharp snippets and named values. So in the first step here, I am using a set variable policy to read the, uh, the, the, the header continent length in the incoming request and saving it in a variable called a body size. As you can see, to read that header, I just wrote a very simple stitch up snippet to access the request context. And then in the next step, I'm running a conditional logic to check the value of that variable. If it's less than 256K, then I don't do anything. But if it's bigger than that, if it's larger than that, then I will reroute the request to a different backend. So let's say my scenario here is that I have a dedicated host for larger requests, right? So as you can see, instead of providing the actual URL and uh, template for, the, for my backend, I use a couple named values, which helps to keep my policy clean and simple. So as developers, we know that completely uh, replacing a complex monolithic system with microservices can be a huge undertaking, right? And often, we would want to do a gradual migration to a new system while keep the old system running to handle features that have not been migrated yet. However, the problem of running two versions of a system is that the client applications need to know where a particular feature is located, right? And every time when a feature is migrated to the new system, the client applications also need to be updated to point to the new location, right? This is certainly not ideal. And this is something that API management can help as well during your migration from monolith to microservices. Essentially, API management enables you to implement the strangler pattern by creating a facade in front of your legacy system while gradually migrating features into the new system. As, as Helg has mentioned, this facade allows you to make everything look consistent, allows you to make everything look like they are coming from the same place, right? Consumer applications, they can continue using the same interface without any changes. In fact, they are not even aware of the migrations happening behind the scene. This pattern helps you to minimize the risk from the migration. You can add new functionality to the new system at whatever pace you like. Over time, as features are migrated to the new uh, system, the old system is eventually strangled and no longer needed and can be safely um, retired. This is something that Vips did, and we see a lot of customers following the same pattern. So as you, can, as you saw, uh, Vips, they use API management together with AKS. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can deploy API management together with AKS. So if you are deploying your microservices into Kubernetes, you will have a swarm of pods in a cluster running your containers, right? And then you will create services in front of these pods because pods kind of come in and go. They can die at any time, right? They don't have a reliable IP address. But services create this abstraction layer in front of your pods and provide a reliable way to access your pods. And theoretically, in many cases, each service can be mapped as one API in API management. But the question here is, if my API management instance does not sit in the same virtual network as my Kubernetes cluster, how does it communicate with my cluster, right? The answer is pretty straightforward. Essentially, you can install an ingress controller, which supports mutual TLS or mutual certificate authentication, so that API management can just talk to your cluster using mutual TLS. And then your services in your cluster is securely exposed through API management. This is your first option. But in some cases, we would prefer to keep our AKS cluster completely private without any public endpoints right, from uh, the cluster. In that case, you can deploy API management into the same VNet as your AKS cluster. And then since the communication between API management and AKS is inside the VNet, right, you, no, you no longer need mutual TLS or the ingress controller, API management can just talk to AKS directly. And in this case, API management becomes the single interface between inside the VNet and outside of the VNet, and everything needs to go through API management. And, and optionally, you can also add uh, Azure Application Gateway in front of API management for additional uh, you know, web features. So this is your second option. And then in some cases, we might choose Azure Functions to implement serverless microservices, right? 
The good news is that API management works great with Azure Functions as well. In fact, we have first-class integration with Azure Functions, so you can easily publish your function apps as APIs in API management within just a few clicks. So let's see how the mappings look like. If we are developing an application with functions, we will have a function app with multiple functions inside it. Each function represents a resource in our application, right? And each of these functions uh, will support one or more HTTP verbs depending on our scenario, such as get, post, or put. And then you can map this function app as an API in API management with multiple operations in, my, in this API. For example, uh, in my example here, uh, my function app is mapped as three operations under my API in API management, get order, post order, and a get product. And then API management can talk to your function app securely using you know, multiple mechanisms such as function key, uh, managed identity, uh, you know, OAuth to access token, or IP filtering. And then my function app is securely exposed through API management and enjoys all the benefits of API management. And for some people, they might prefer to use multiple function apps for different reasons, like uh, deployment boundary, uh, you know, better isolation, or so forth. That's totally fine. That's purely personal or organizational preference. If you do use multiple function apps, you can still map them in, as a single API in API management. So over the last couple of years, some of our customers mentioned that they are looking for a lightweight API gateway to be used together with their microservices, right? Therefore, we have released a new SKU of API management called Consumption. Essentially, it runs on the same infrastructure as Azure Functions. Therefore, it comes with certain serverless properties, such as instant provisioning, automated scaling, back uh, out and back to zero when there's no traffic, and high availability. And it also has a different pricing model. So basically, uh, it has a pay-per-action pricing model so that we will be charging customers based on the number of API calls. If there is no call, there is no charge. Because it's, because, uh, because it's lightweight, so it comes with a curated feature set. For example, there is no developer portal, and there is no built-in uh, cache, but you can bring your own Redis-compatible cache. The primary use cases for this new SKU is to create a gateway for serverless and container-based microservices running in Kubernetes, functions, or logic apps. You can also use it to create a simplified and a secure facade for other serverless, uh, for other serverless resources, such as service bus, storage, or event hubs. And because of its serverless properties, it's a good fit for spiky or, or uh, unpredictable workloads as well, and you can also use it as an entry-level API management offering. This new SKU has been in preview since December, and we will make it generally available in the next few weeks. So Sven has done a great job uh, talking about the journey of how they figured out the effective deployment model for them, right, that works for them. And when we go talk to our customers, automation has certainly become one of the most common questions. So to elaborate a little bit on this challenge, to, uh, you know, organizations today, they often have multiple deployment environments, such as development, QA, and production. And some of these environments are often shared by many API development teams, right? Each are responsible for one or more APIs. In the VIPs example, uh, they have four different teams sharing the same API management instance. So the problems here are threefold. First of all, how do I automate the deployment of APIs into my API management instance, right? And second, how do I migrate my configurations from one environment to another? And also, if, if my API management instance is shared by multiple teams, how do I avoid the interference between different teams when they are doing deployment into my instance, right? Unfortunately, the answer to this challenge is that it depends. There's, when it comes to CI, CD uh, you know, pipelines, there's no uh, you know, one-size-fits-all solution because it depends on a lot of different factors, such as your organizational structure, your engineering culture, your existing tools and processes, and so forth. But with API management, we support a variety of deployment options, so you can choose the, best, uh, you know, choose the one that works best for you. 
uh, with VIPs, uh, they figured out that uh, PowerShell works the best for them, which is great. But you can also use our RESTful API, Resource Manager templates or ARM templates, and uh, our SDKs, or any combination of them. So if you do prefer to use ARM um, templates, we actually have an alternative approach that we published on GitHub. You can find it in, the, in, in this link, aka.ms slash apimdevops. As Sven has mentioned, uh, ARM templates uh, has a learning curve, which is absolutely true. Therefore, uh, in this repository, we also provided a couple utility tools to help you to automate the creation of ARM templates so that developers do not need to create those templates uh, you know, manually. And also, these tools, they are open sourced. So uh, if you, um, you, know, you can easily ex extend and customize them to meet your unique uh, you know, DevOps needs. And additionally, we are currently working on a VS Code extension for API management as, a, as another way for you to configure your API management instances. Uh, the extension will come with a resource, resource explorer so that you can list, create, and delete your API management instances and their sub-resources, such as APIs, products, operations, policies, named values, and the loggers. And one of the main focus of this extension is that we want to make policy editing more productive. Therefore, this extension will support features like you know, XML and C-sharp syntax check, as you have seen our policy is a combination of uh, XML and C-sharp. It will also support IntelliSense, such as code completion, hover for uh, parameter description, and so forth. You can also easily add policies for common scenarios using policy snippets. We are also looking into the possibility of uh, you know, allowing testing your APIs and your API management configurations in VS Code by either connecting to a remote API management instance or connecting to a local API gateway that runs on your computer. And we are uh, actively looking for feedback, so if you have any feedback or if you want to see additional uh, scenarios, please do talk to me. We are still in the early phase of this uh, work, so, we are, uh, so feedback is highly uh, uh, you know, appreciated. So finally, I want to spend a couple, a couple of minutes talking about where we are going as a product and, and our vision. So as you may know, currently, API management is a cloud offering that only runs on Azure, right? However, many organizations today, they have their backend services not only on Azure, but also in foreign clouds or on-premises, right? In those cases, the communication becomes less effective, less efficient, because API calls need to travel through the Azure-hosted gateway before they go to their backend, right? Therefore, our team is currently working on a containerized API gateway. Customers will be able to host their gateway component uh, wherever their backend services are located. It can be in a Kubernetes cluster on Azure. It can be in foreign clouds, on-premises, or on the edge. These remote, uh, self-hosted gateways will be communicating with your API management instance in Azure to pull configurations and push telemetry. And API calls from clients can be issued directly to the gateways hosted at the location of your backend services, therefore eliminating the performance penalty. This also improves security as requests will stay within the same uh, cloud or data center when a local client calls a local backend service. So this is where we are going uh, and where we want our product to be in the next 12 months. If you want to learn more about this self-hosted gateway, uh, as well as our other announcements at the build uh, from API management, please watch uh, BRK 2012 from yesterday. Um, it's a great session from Vladimir and Adam uh, at Wegmans. Uh, talking about API-first architecture. Uh, we also made announcements about the self-hosted API gateway, the brand new developer portal, and uh, the GA plan for the consumption tier. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about API management, here are a few links that might be helpful to you. And you will get a copy of the deck, so uh, they'll be there. And thank you. Just the logistics, please submit your evaluation. Thank you.